All right. Why don't we start with prayer then? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Mm -hmm. Heavenly King, comfort of the Spirit of Truth, who are ever present and fills all things. Treasure your blessings and giver of life, come and abide in us, cleanse us of all stain, and save our souls of good one. Amen. Well, thank you all for, for coming back. Um, to recap a little bit where we've been, as I, I try to do each time, just so that we can reorient ourselves and make sure that we're, we're following. Um, we spoke about the way that God originally uh, made Adam and Eve, his plan for them in paradise, their job and responsibility to spread paradise throughout the entire world. They, of course, sin, and in no time, they um, have not spread God's presence throughout the world, but rather have spread sin and corruption to such an astonishing degree and to such a degree of, of demonic oppression that God decides to recreate the world he uh, floods the earth in a recreation event, charges Noah and his family to go back into the world with a similar charge to what he gave to Adam and Eve, but this time with recognition that it is a fallen world. The nations don't spread, they remain. He scatters the nations, and out of Ur in Mesopotamia, he calls one man, Abram, to come to Canaan makes a series of promises to him. Um, we sort of left off there. Of course, the most important promise that he gives him not only is that he would form a people out of Abraham's uh, uh, offspring, but that that offspring would eventually, one of them, would become a blessing to all of the nations, and that his offspring would be like the stars and that they would rule with God sharing in his glory in the heavens as the holy ones. This promise, though, has been made. Um, it has not yet been fulfilled. And now we're going to move forward and talk a little bit more about that. Um, so we're talking about Moses tonight. And I want to start by first orienting us a little bit back to the timeline that we've been looking at. So when we talk about Moses, so for example, the Exodus, what period of time are we looking at? There's two ways of looking at this dating system to figure that out. The, the first way is that it says in the book of 1 Kings that Solomon established uh, the temple in the fourth year of his reign, which was the 480th year from the Exodus. Okay. Well, if we work our way back from that, that would give us the date of 1446, basically, for the Exodus, because we can date Solomon with quite a bit of accuracy. What's hard there, it's hard to quite determine, is that number 480, remember I've talked about before how dating in the Bible gets really tricky, because they're not always necessarily trying to do it in the way that a history textbook does it. Right? This is a perfect example of where it gets tricky because that date 480 is 12 times 40. 12 for the tribes of Israel and 40 for the years in the desert, which is also a holy number, right? And so when you multiply 12 times 40, all of a sudden, you know, you get that 480 number. It's not clear whether Solomon is being symbolic there or if he's being, you know, historiographical like we might today. So if you look at information from outside of the Bible, the best that we can do in terms of the archaeology, looking at, for example, when Ramses II was the pharaoh in Egypt and when these cities were being built, again, as best as our archaeology can put together, you come out with a date closer to about 1275. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter, right? Because what really matters is the fact that it did happen. Um, but I, I really, more than anything, do this to, to sort, of, sort of orient ourselves, but also just to underscore that people who try to take every single date in the Bible as being exactly the way that, that we would report dates in a history book today might be missing the point, right? That's not necessarily what the Bible authors are trying to convey 
in every single date that they, they do. Um, but this gives us a little bit of an idea of the time period that we're talking about. Let's look a little bit again at the geography as we've, we've looked at before, right? We're now talking about Egypt. We'll get to, the, to a little bit of why we're talking about Egypt in just a moment. But we're largely talking about Egypt. We're going to hear in particular about a land called Goshen, or an area called Goshen within Egypt. Um, most places have it just sort of over here near, you know, Mendes above Memphis, um, you know, near the city of Ramses. Basically, it's the Nile Delta. This is the breadbasket of the ancient world, right? Even going forward under, under Rome, this is still going to be the breadbasket of the ancient world, right? That's where people went when they needed food, so to speak. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there's a lot to it. But then also we're going to talk, actually, as we go a little bit further, <clears throat> you don't need to know all of these, these lines or anything, but the point in, in, in raising this is just to give you a sense of the geography of what we're talking about. So this has the land of Goshen a little bit higher, right? But it's near uh, where Ramses and Tanis would be. Um, we're going to talk about the Sinai Peninsula, right? We hear a lot about Sinai, and that's that peninsula in between the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aqaba. This over here is Saudi Arabia, right? This is Jordan and Israel over here today. Mount Sinai is also going to be referred to at times as Mount Horeb. Um, you'll hear both of those titles in the Old Testament. What you'll see here is that there are these trade routes that were very, very active during this time period. And in particular, one that's really relevant for us is this, um, it was some, sometimes referred to in, in scholarly language or scholarly literature as the Via Maris, the, the way of the sea, or the sea route. Right here towards the land of the Philistines goes through Gaza, right, right through land of Israel. That was a primary trade route in that Fertile Crescent. One of the primary things that was going on in that particular trade route was the slave trade. And so, for example, when we hear in just a moment about uh, Abraham's uh, descendant Joseph being sold by his brothers into slavery for, by traders who were headed to Egypt, Egypt selling their slaves in Egypt, that's exactly what was going on in this Via Maris there along the sea during that time period. David, could I ask you real quick to close that door? Um, thank you. Um, in fact, the historical and archeological evidence relating to that route is so exact that um, they can actually trace the price of a slave throughout the centuries that were being traded along that route. So much so, that if we go back, round about this time of the, you know, the, the 1800s BC, what would you guess was the price of a slave sold in Egypt by that trade route? Well, in US dollars? By, no, by, by, by in, those, in, in their days, it was 20 pieces of silver. Incidentally, when you read Genesis, how much was Joseph sold for? It was 20 pieces of silver, right? Our archaeological record actually matches with that and says, yep, that's what slaves were going for at the time. Um, it's an interesting sort of, you know, we believe the Bible, but somehow, for whatever reason, as modern people, we tend to believe what's outside the Bible more than we believe the Bible, unfortunately. <laughs> but it, it is nice sometimes when, when they, they match up and we can... You know, see, the archaeologist told us, and so obviously it must be right. It wasn't enough to hear the word of God. Um, anyway, so this is the ge geography of what we'll be talking about. Before I launch into the story, um, I have to say, I was telling Themis about this on the drive over. I struggled with tonight's class more than I've struggled with any of the classes in our series. Because when we talk about the story of Moses... You're talking about four at least books of the Old Testament, right? There are more books, more chapters, more verses, more words spoken of about Moses in the Old Testament than any other figure in the Old Testament, okay? 
there is so much that we can talk about. Um, the typology with Christ and, and you know, the image of the cross that shows up over and over again, the image of baptism that shows up over and over again. You can talk about you know, him being rescued from the river as a baby and what's going on with Pharaoh there. You can talk about the burning bush. You can talk about um, you know, the plagues and what's going on with, with Pharaoh in Egypt. You can talk about Sinai. You can talk about the wanderings in the desert. You can talk about all the things going on there with uh, bronze serpents and talking donkeys and battles and all sorts of things that are going on in the course of this story. And I keep having to remind myself that what we're doing here is we're giving an overview. And the point of this is to give the basic structure to the Old Testament so that we can understand what's going on in the covenantal system. Um, if I were to stop and actually try to chase down all of that amazing, rich teaching and theology and revelation going on in those books, it would be all I'd talk about for the next uh, year. And... and uh, we'd lose sight of what we're trying to do with the structure. So I've had to self-edit, and what that means is that at the end of this class tonight, you are going to say, yeah, but what about this, and what about that, and what about all these other things? And the answer is, I know. <laughs> I'm totally with you. Um, and hopefully in future studies, we can talk about some of those other aspects. Uh, you know, forgive me now. I'm probably going to miss whatever is your favorite story of the entire Moses saga. I'm probably not going to address it tonight. Um, the other thing that I would say is, as much as I love um, Cecil DeMille's version of Moses, okay, he was not Charlton Heston. Get that movie out of your mind. <laughs> Um, much less was he a cartoon figure created by the folks at Walt Disney, you know, Prince or whoever made Prince of Egypt, I think it was Disney, right? Whoever made it. Get that out of your mind too. Because the reality is we have a bad habit. Quick little tangent. There's a reason I never saw Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ. Even though it was well praised, everybody loved it, everybody said how well it was made, and I'm sure it was. But there's an element there of, I don't want somebody else's vision, some filmmaker's vision of the scripture, and however they've done it in order to try and maximize ticket sales, to be influencing how I approach scripture and see it, right? The reality is today, when I read The Lord of the Rings, I see Gandalf as the guy from the movies, no matter how much I try, right? And as much as Jim Caviezel is a great guy, I don't want to see him when I think about Christ reading the Bible, right? And so, anyway, we have that same problem when we get to Moses, is we see Charlton Heston, okay? And, and um, I mean, first of all, he was a Semite. <laughs> he was not a Heston. Um, anyway, so I just say that to say sort of, you know, be conscious of how that's working in your mind and, and do what you can to check that as we go through. So, let's talk about what's happened. Joseph sold into slavery in the land of Egypt. Um, he eventually wins the trust of Pharaoh and ends up leading and becoming the right-hand man, so to speak, of the Pharaoh. He does everything that he can in this wonderful uh, story at the end of Genesis, how he reunites his entire family, his entire clan in Egypt. Jacob and all of them come down, 70-something people in total. They, um, they arrive there in Egypt, and he eventually settles them in this land of Goshen, a little bit outside of the main populated area, because it was a wonderful area for the sheep and the goats to pasture. This is not a unique thing in the ancient world. And the reason I say that is, right, they're, they're growing, and they're growing, and they're growing. Uh, it says that the Israelites uh, multiplied and grew exceedingly strong, so the land was filled with them. There are plenty of historical and archaeological records outside of the Bible showing that there were a lot of Semitic people during that time period settling in and around Egypt. Again, it was the breadbasket of the ancient world. This was a place where you could eat, right? You could feed your family living in Egypt. 
and there were a whole lot of immigrant people living in the land of Egypt. <clears throat> but as so often happens, by the way, I, I love the icons of Joseph that you'll find because usually they depict him as being essentially the, the right-hand man of Pharaoh. And a lot of times people will see it, you know, up in a dome somewhere and they'll say, why is there a Pharaoh on your wall? Um, well, that's Joseph. Um, anyway, what happens though over time, as often happens with immigrant people that come in, and are seen as taking our jobs and our food. They get demoted a little bit more in, in their society and a little bit more in their society and a little bit more until after a short period of time, or rather some period of time, they find themselves in slavery. You can find actually in some of the uh, paintings in Egypt to this day, depictions of Semitic people being enslaved, making bricks using their feet and their hands and the straw and leaving them out to bake in the sun in order to build the great cities of Egypt, Ramses and others. Um, so this is not, uh, there, there is certainly plenty of extra biblical support for, for Semitic peoples having immigrated to Egypt and then eventually finding themselves in slavery. But the Israelites in particular, because they were, um, very prolific. They had a lot of babies, and all of a sudden they're taking over in a sense in terms of numbers, and the Egyptians are concerned about this. And so they, they afflict them and put them into slavery. Against that backdrop, Yahweh hears the cries of his people. He remembers his covenant with Abraham. By the way, I love that line, right? He hears the cries of his people, as he does to this day. He remembers his covenant with Abraham. He proves himself the ruler of all, Pantocrat, by defeating the most powerful king of that era and his gods on his own territory. He leads his people to freedom with a whole bunch of spoil. Right? They end up actually leaving, it says the Egyptian people gave them their gold and their jewelry. That's what the golden calf ends up becoming, right? Uh, or coming from. The uh, people of Israel are rescued from a strong enemy despite her weakness and sin. She is delivered from slavery and poverty. She begins her journey to the promised land. One thing to note is that it wasn't just Hebrews or Israelites who came up out of Egypt. They also brought with them a whole bunch of non-Jewish people who decided they wanted to go with Israel. Caleb being one of the primary examples of that in, in the story. Caleb was not an Israelite, but he becomes one by going with them up out of the land of, of Egypt. Um, there in the desert at Mount Sinai, God forms with them a covenant. We spoke before about the ancient treaty and what format that would often come in. Right? There was a preamble introducing the suzerain, the one in, in control or power. There was a historical prologue. There were stipulations and obligations, including loyalty, the deposition of the written document in the temple of the gods sworn under, and periodic reading, a list of witnesses, usually deities, and blessings and curses. Remember this, we, we covered this a couple of months ago. Um, <clears throat> the covenant at Sinai. Right? He re God reveals himself to the people of Israel in a way they will understand. He says, They were once not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. This quotation from 1 Peter, while he's talking about us as Christians, he's also echoing the language of the people at Sinai. God says, If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So it begins with a preamble and a historical prologue. I am Yahweh your God, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And if you look, many of the passages throughout the Torah begin with this kind of language. God is constantly saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of slavery. Right? Constantly reminding, it's, but he's using this covenantal uh, form 
this treaty form of language as a way of constantly reminding them, but also reinforcing that there's a covenant here. As we said, the relationship precedes obedience. He's already delivered them, and now he's going to give them the stipulations. The stipulations and the obligations imposed, you shall have no other gods before me. Um, so there is loyalty to the only, only suzerain, and then he provides the other commandments. There's the deposition, the periodic reading, the tablets are placed into the Ark of the Covenant. Remember we talked about the fact that there were two tablets because the same uh, covenant, Barith, was written on each. So that one would be for the suzerain and one for the vassal, but they kept them together in the Ark of the Covenant. And it was stipulated in Deuteronomy that it would be read to the people on an ongoing basis. There's a list of witnesses calling on heaven and earth to witness against you today. So he, God invokes all the powers of heaven and earth as his witnesses. He gives cursing, curses and blessings for the following of the covenant. Now, all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you will obey Yahweh your God. All these curses shall come upon you and overtake you um, if you don't. And then finally, it's ratified through a sacrifice. Right? Exodus 24, Moses takes the book of the covenant, reads it to the people. They respond, we will do everything the Lord has said, we will obey. Moses then takes the blood, sprinkles it on the people and says, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. And so what we see in God's covenant with Moses is the, already the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham. We see the promise of people, right? Abraham's offspring becoming a new nation, right? In that period of 400 to 500 years that they were in Egypt, they've gone from the original 70 to being uh, in, in somewhere, I think in Exodus, it refers to 500,000 men, plus their women and their children, all crossing the Red Sea. He's already identified the place, Cain in the promised land. He says, I'm now leading you up to the promised land and he establishes where his presence, right? We said that, that it's the people of God and the place of God and the presence of God, right? This is starting to be fleshed out in the Mosaic Covenant because he's now established his presence among his people in the tabernacle. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, all right, just pause there because I've sort of quickly summarized a lot, including some of which was, was um, you know, refreshing what we've talked about before. Are there any questions at this point, though, before we move on? Okay. So, one of the things, one of the most important things that happens at Sinai is that God has now formed a new nation. We talked about the fact that there were the 70 nations identified in Genesis that were scattered. He's now formed a new nation not one of the original nations. He's formed a new nation that is his nation, his people, right? He says, now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. It was a theocracy ruled by God, right? It was a nation ruled by God. But he ruled through his priest, or his priest, a prophet, and a king. Okay. So priest, of course the high priest was Aaron. Their job within Israel was to offer the sacrifices to manage the sins of the people and lead them in worship. He speaks for the people to God. There were three ranks of the priesthood in the Old Testament. There was the high priest, the priests who were the sons of Aaron, and the Levites. Um, and a, yes? Is that his censer in his left arm? Um, no, I think that's the jar of manna. Ah. So that's the, his rod, which budded, okay. right? And I believe that's supposed to be the jar of manna. So in the book, The, the Wisdom of Sirach, there's a wonderful um, discussion of who Aaron was in chapter 45, if I can find it here, uh, 6 through 22. It says, He exalted Aaron, meaning God, a holy man like himself, 
Oh, no, I'm sorry. He's talking about Moses. He exalted Aaron, a holy man like himself, his brother from the tribe of Levi. He established an everlasting covenant with him and gave him the priesthood of the people. He blessed him with orderly behavior and covered him with an adornment of glory. He clothed him with the consummation of boasting and confirmed him with instruments of strength. Um, he encircled him with tassels with many golden bells all around to sound their ring at his steps, making their ringing sound as he walked in the temple as a reminder for the children of his people. And uh, it, it goes on. He says, his sacrifices shall be a whole burnt offering perpetually twice every day. Moses ordained him and anointed him with holy oil. It was an eternal covenant for him and for his seed forever to minister to the Lord and serve as priest, to bless his people in his name. He chose him from all the living to offer sacrifices to the Lord, incense and sweet-smelling offerings as a remembrance, to make atonement for your people. Anyway, and he, and he continues. It's a wonderful passage to read. Um, God also appointed a prophet in Israel. In this case, it was Moses. Um, we still to this day call him the prophet and God seer. Incidentally, as best I can tell, it's interesting. His, the tablets in his hand appear to be written um, in, in a Syriac script, which is, of course, a later Semitic development, probably from that time period whenever this icon was being created. It's fascinating because then in the scroll, it's in Greek, which is kind of an interesting mm -hmm. little detail that's going on there. Um, Syriac then talks about Moses. Um, <clears throat> he brought from him a man of mercy who found favor in the eyes of all flesh, beloved by God and man, Moses, whose, res whose remembrance is blessed, he made him equal in glory to the saints. And mag now, by the way, this is he made him equal in glory to the holy ones, right? In English, we anachronistically say saints. In Greek, that says iagi, right? Who are the holy ones? It's the angels. This goes back to that promise to Abraham, right? He made him equal in glory to the holy ones and magnified him in the fears of his enemies. With his words, he caused signs to cease, and the Lord honored him in the presence of kings, and so on. It's worth reading that entire chapter 45 of the Sirach. And then finally, God promised that there would be a king. He says, when you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. Now, I'll add that point at the end because as we get to next time, Israel is going to get impatient and demand a king of their choosing, not of God's choosing. Okay? It's going to set up some real problems. But he promises already that when you come to the promised land, I will choose a king for you and set up a king. King was a civic leader. He was the administrator, and his job was to make sure the people kept the covenant. That authority, in the meantime, was shared with 70 elders um, that were appointed to judge in the various tribes, right, which you read about also in Deuteronomy. Incidentally, we read that reading on the eve of all the feasts of the ecumenical councils um, about the 70 elders who are appointed to judge. Isn't it interesting that there are 12 tribes and that there are 70 elders within those 12 tribes as we get into the land of Israel. And what does Christ do when he appoints his disciples? He appoints 12 apostles, and then he appoints the 70. Right? There's a clear, a clear parallel going on in what Christ is doing. Jesus Christ then summarizes all three of those roles as priest, prophet, and king. Eusebius of Caesarea, who was the biographer of St. Constantine, writing in the early 4th century, he says, We have been told also that certain of the prophets themselves became, by the act of anointing, Christ's in type, so that all these have reference to the true Christ, the divinely inspired and heavenly word, who is the only high priest of all, and the only king of every creature, and the Father's only supreme prophet of prophets. Christ takes all three of those roles to himself. And then, of course, shares them with us. Um, questions on this part? Yeah. I want to Melchizedek again. Uh -huh. High priest, right, in the order of Melchizedek. In the order of Melchizedek, yeah. yeah. Melchizedek. And, and, and 
Right. He, he is the high priest in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron. Right. Because the order of Aaron was a, a genetic sort of, you know, lineage thing. Christ's priesthood is not tied to genetic lineage. Right. Right. Exactly. It's divided from these other roles and he takes it right because Melchizedek was a king priest, yeah. right? Who also acts in a prophetic role in speaking the truth of God and blessing Abraham. And so you see in Melchizedek all three of those roles being rolled into one. And and it's why Christ then is seen as being, you know, why Melchizedek is seen as a type of Christ, we should say. Right. You know, going back four or five frames, you could have had a Israel, did he call his people Israel? Mm -hmm. Now, is that does that mean the people of Israel? Does it mean the people of Jacob? Yep. I mean, Jacob's name is Israel, right? Yeah. But already, we're seeing that it's more than that. It's more than his descendants, because it also includes those non-Israelites who came up out of Egypt with them. There's already an opportunity, right? We're seeing glimpses of people outside Gen of that biological, Gentiles. yeah, those Gentiles being incorporated into the nation, right? Never thought of that in a moment. Um, but when they were known as Hebrew, right, the Israel was, right? Yeah, all of those different names. Hebrew is what they often referred to them, um, what the people outside called them, right? Israel was the name given by God to them. Well, it's probably not surprising that the people outside of who didn't recognize Yahweh would call them by a different name, mm -hmm. right? Incidentally, the language is never called Hebrew. In, in the Old Testament, they call it Judahite, <laughs> right? Or, or, or you know, uh, Ju Judah-ish. Well, no, Aramaic's a different Aramaic's language. Different. Aramaic's a different language, yeah. Um, you know, same, same tree, but they split off actually relatively early. Um, yeah, it's never called, the language is never called Hebrew. They call it Judahite. Um, in the old, I think it's in Esther, I forget where. Anyway, um, all right. So what's interesting is that this gets celebrated in, in Israel by the Jews on the Feast of Pentecost, okay? It's um, Shavuot, or the, the Feast of, of Weeks, um, which you know, the Book of Jubilees, which is not in the Bible, but it's the second temple literature that gets referred to often by the Jews. In, in, and actually, the Epistle of Jude in the New Testament makes references to the Book of Jubilees. Um, it refers to the Feast of Weeks as being twofold and of two natures. So it's not only the Feast of the First Fruits, which is how it's initially set up in the Mosaic Covenant, but it becomes very uh, eventually recognized as being the annual celebration of the establishment of the covenant in the nationhood of Israel at Sinai. Okay, So the Feast of Pentecost under the Old Testament really becomes, and that's why it becomes such a powerful feast and why we read, remember in Acts chapter 2, when we read about Pentecost, it already had the name Pentecost before the Holy Spirit came down, right? Because it's already an important Jewish feast and people are gathering in Jerusalem. And the primary thing that by that point they're celebrating is the establishment of the covenant with Moses and the nationhood of Israel at Sinai. Okay. Incidentally, on that day, when that covenant and nationhood was established at Sinai, remember that the, the, the Levites go out and kill 3,000 men who had worshipped the golden calf. Right? 3,000 men die that day on the, the initial day of the establishment of the covenant. Why does that matter? Fast forward, the new law in the coming of the Holy Spirit, the commandment of love, which the Holy Spirit inscribes in each person's heart, is given by God to his people that day and inscribed on the tablets of our hearts. Having now made the journey of Exodus from death into life through Christ's death and resurrection, God's people Israel is reconstituted on that day. And on that day, the church sees its first fruits. It says that 3,000 people are baptized that day as a result of the preaching of St. Peter and the other apostles. Right. Right. The same number of souls that lost their life in the establishment of, first, the, of the Mosaic Covenant 
gain eternal life on the day of the new Pentecost. We reference this actually in the Cantacion of the Cross, which is sung not only on September 14th, but we actually sing it every Wednesday and Friday, and at the beginning part of Orthros every day of the year except for Bright Week. Um, if you come early to Orthros on Sundays, you'll actually hear this in the very first part. Lift it up of thine own will upon the cross, do thou bestow thy mercy upon the new commonwealth. Some translations will actually say the new nation that bears thy name. Make the Orthodox people glad in thy strength, giving them victory over their enemies. May thy cross assist them in battle, weapon of peace, and an incomparable ensign of victory. We are the new nation established by the cross and the coming of the Holy Spirit. Right? Yeah. So I know that Israel celebrated Pentecost too. Mm -hmm. It was not a new name. So what right. so you're connecting Feast of Weeks and Feast of Pentecost. How was their Pentecost part of that? Um well, in terms of, I mean, we're, we're seeing it transform. You mean in terms of how we celebrate it today? Well, I'm or? just thinking about, I was thinking like their Pentecost and our Pentecost is a fulfillment, but to, to connect Feast of Weeks too, it's interesting. What was Pentecost about for them? It was, it, so in addition to the establishing of the, the new covenant, or, or the covenant and the nationhood, it was also the Feast of First Fruits. Oh, okay. And what do we see on that day? The First Fruits of the church, right? So yeah, it's both of those things, right? It's the Feast of First Fruits, of the preaching of the Gospel. It's also the Feast of the Establishment of the New Covenant and the New Nationhood of the Church. Which is why, you know, sometimes we, we mix our metaphors a little bit, but we'll talk about it being the birthday of the Church. You'll sometimes hear that being referred to, Pentecost is the birthday of the Church. The Fathers actually don't say that. They say the Church exists and extends backwards through all time. Um, but what they're referring to is exactly this, right? That it is sort of the, the, a new nation um, in continuance, though, and in fulfillment of the new nation form at Sinai. Okay. Um, you actually generally will not hear me refer to Pentecost as the birthday of the church for that reason. Many of the fathers actually don't like that language. It's become so common, and we say it all the time. And it's true if you understand it in a certain way, but it's not true in all the other ways. <laughs> um, anyway, all right. Uh, it, this is why I love this this hymn. By the way, when we when we read this hymn at the beginning of Orthos every Sunday or every Matins, um, you know, there's actually so much packed into that. It's a summary of everything that took place from the scattering of the nations in Genesis, all the way through to the covenant of Sinai and the establishment of the nation out of Israel all the way through the cross and resurrection of Pentecost is all kind of getting summarized and referenced in that one sentence at the beginning of this hymn. Um. <clears throat> now, God also establishes his presence among his people there in the Sinai Desert. He tells Moses as he climbs up Sinai, remember, Moses climbs up, and it's interesting, there's this threefold um, staging of who goes up the mountain. Because of the people of Israel down in the plain, you have the 70 who have consecrated themselves and kept themselves ritually clean. They go up a little ways up the mountain. You have the Aaron and his sons that go a little bit further up with Moses, and then Moses goes to the very peak. Okay? And it's there that he encounters God and sees and talks. It says he talks to God face to face. Right? Um, and when he sees there on top of the mountain, God says, make that the pattern for the tabernacle that you make down below. Okay. Um, what is unique, though, is that in the tabernacle, is that there, and we'll talk about the tabernacle in a second, it's a cycle of presence and absence. God is there, and then sometimes not there. When the cloud covers the tabernacle, they stay. When the cloud removes and lifts from the tabernacle, then they all continue to move, right? And we'll see that play out when we get to the temple, right? On the Day of Atonement, the priest goes in, and the cloud covers it, and the presence of God is there in the temple at the Day of Atonement, but not the rest of the time, right? 
So he's with his people, but it's still not a continuous presence. So we talked before about the tent of meeting or the tabernacle and the fact, the way that it mirrored in some ways it reflects patterns um, is an icon of paradise, right? Paradise being that mountain of the Lord, which had the outer wall and then the inner garden, right? With the hedge around, the veil around the tree of life where the presence of God was in the inner part, right? You know, this is the part where, um, right, most people only ever stayed out here, right? If you were a man, and you were ritually clean, and had a purpose of offering a sacrifice, you would be able to enter into the outer courts in order to bring your sacrifice there, right? But then, uh, only the priests would go into the, the main tent of meeting and only the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and then as it says in Hebrew but once a year in the letter to the Hebrews right and so it's this pattern right of threefold stages right you have the 70 you have the, the sons of Aaron and then you have Moses in this case as the, as the prophet going up to the height of Sinai this is being established in the Ten of Meeting. But what you should see is, I said earlier on in one of the prior sessions, right, the Ten of Meeting was set up this way to pattern paradise, which was the mountain of God. What is Sinai when God's presence is there and Moses is on the mountain talking face to face with God? It becomes the mountain of God, right? And then what we'll see in Ezekiel going forward is what is it going to refer to Zion as being? mountain of God once the temple is built and God's presence is established there right it's paradise breaking through it's God's presence breaking through it becomes the mountain of God no wonder uh, Peter wanted to stay there yeah exa well exactly because then right Tabor becomes the mountain of God and there's there's gosh see now you're going to give me I wrote a whole essay about this last year there, there is a, a remarkable connection Right between what's going on in Sinai, what's going on in Zion, and what's going on in Tabor in the in the um, uh, in the Transfiguration. I mean, incidentally, right? Why is it Moses and Elijah on Tabor with Christ in the Transfiguration? Because they're the ones who saw God. Right? They saw God, and so for them to be there witnessing to Him, they're saying. This is the God we saw. Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the God we saw on his holy mountain. Right. We, we, I think we, we tend to think, well, law and prophets. and Okay, but why them? Why them specifically? Because what does it say in the old law? Something can be established by the testimony of two witnesses. This is what it says in the Mosaic Law, right? A fact is established, the truthfulness of a fact is established by the testimony of two witnesses. And who are Christ's two witnesses? The only two men who saw God face to face, and talked to him, and experienced his presence on his holy mountain. They come and they say, this is that God. Right? Um, there, it's not just about blessing grapes. Was there one? Did Jacob see his face and live? Oh, you're going to do it. Okay. Well, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And, and um, there's a lot to unpack there, okay. right? Yeah. Uh, and, and so the, the simple answer is yes. Okay. Yeah, we'll, and we'll, 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 we'll go back. Yeah, we'll get to it, right? I mean, and that's the other thing, right? Moses comes down from the mountain shining with an uncreated light, right? And what envelops all of them at the transfiguration, but is that uncreated light, but now we realize that it's emanating from Christ himself, right? Um, and what is the witness of so many of our saints, but exactly that, right? I know this, uh, uh, um, 
actually he's now a bishop, I know, he tells the story of, um, he was a novice monk, and he was going to be accepted as a monk the next day. And the abbot tells him um, that he's to go and give a life confession to a holy elder there in the monastery. This is in Volam in Russia. Um, to give a life confession that night before being accepted into the monastery uh, the next day. And so he, but the, the abbot tells him, go early because this monk, this elder, closes his door early in the night so that he can pray. And if you miss it, he's not gonna open it for anybody. You'll go, you're gonna have to wait until the morning. So, um, uh, you know, my friend rushes over there and sure enough, he gets there too late, the door's closed. Okay. And he says, well, you know what? I've gotta make, I, I gotta make my confession before I can be accepted to the monastery tomorrow morning at the early liturgy. I'm gonna wait right here in the hallway and I'll just wait. And then that way, when he opens the door first thing in the morning, uh, I'll sneak in, I can make my confession and still make it in time for, for services. So he camps out in the hallway overnight. Now mind you, this is immediately after the breakup of the Soviet Union. Malam has no electricity. And so he's standing there in the hallway in pitch dark. He's praying and all of a sudden, he starts to see flashing blue light coming out from underneath the door of this holy elder. And it continues intensely all night until at some point in the early hours of the night, it just sort of stops. Early hours of the morning, it just stops. And a moment or two after it stops, the elder, Raphael, uh, who had been a, a hermit in the cliffs of Georgia escaping Soviet persecution, um, Father Raphael, opens the door, looks down, and says, come on in, my beloved, and then addresses him by name, even though they've never met, and invites him in. Um, that's the light that Moses saw on Sinai, and that's the light that the disciples saw and enveloped even them uh, on the Feast of Transfiguration. Right? The same, the story of St. Sarah from the Sarah, right, talking to Matabolo, and they're glowing, and at some point, Nicholas, who's there, realizes, you know, St. Seraphim looks at him and says, but you're glowing too, <laughs> right? And it's glowing, right? The story of Elder Arseni in, in Russia, where they're put into the, the underground locker, basically, in the gulags, where people don't make it more than a couple of hours before dying of frostbite. And Elder Arseni brings the other man down there with him, and they both kneel down, and they begin to pray. And in the morning, the Soviets, uh, open up the, the, the door with the, um, you know, the guys who are there to haul them away to the morgue and find them instead kneeling down full of light and warm and everything around them is melted. <laughs> right? Anyway. So we know that this tent of meeting is where God makes his dwelling with his people. And what we know, too, is that in John 1, 14, we read, and the word became flesh and dwelt, and really the right way would be to translate that tabernacle among us. We have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. What is it to see the glory of God? That's what Moses saw in Sinai, right? That is to experience and to see God. So he tabernacles among us, and we have seen his glory. We have seen his presence, something that only Moses was admitted to on Sinai. And yet, in Christ, we are able to experience and to see and to share in that very glory. <clears throat> um, I, I thought I would take a little excursion for the moment. Um, you know, uh, Themis actually had the opportunity some time back to visit Sinai himself. Um, which, as many of you know, became a place for initially Jewish ascetics and then eventually Christian ascetics to live there for many, many years. By the time of Emperor Justinian, uh, we have the establishment of St. Catherine's Monastery, which is still there, there to this day. Um, it's been around so long that St. John Climacos, right, who wrote the latter, we celebrate on the fourth Sunday of Lent, 
um, was the abbot there. Um, and in fact, at one of their celebrations, Moses came and served. Okay, it's a wonderful story. I, I don't have time to go into it, but it, it's, it's a wonderful story about the one time that Moses actually came and helped serve at, at the monastery feast day. Um, but you can see, it gives you a little perspective. This is the plain that they were, that they were stretched out in. And, and them is helping out where is, there's a chapel now where the golden calf. It's on Fuja Glazer. Right here, the laser doesn't work on the screen. Okay, so go up, look, see that tree that's by itself in the center? Okay. And then up to the right of it, okay. there's a, a white reflective building. Mm -hmm. That's the chapel that's in the spot of the calf. Okay. The sanctified. Yeah. So this, the view of where you're at here mm -hmm. is on top of the monastery, facing west, and the, the bush Oops. is, Sorry. the bush is, well, we'll get to the bush in a minute. Wait, behind. why did the Golden Cow Chapel have one side? You're saying right in here? No, no. no, there's a white reflective on the wall to the right. On the wall right there. Over here? No, up higher. Higher. See the pointed tree that's like yeah, to the right? Tree, yeah, to the right. To the right. right. Well, oh, to right. your right. I'm sorry. I'm standing facing you guys. And look, this is the, <laughs> the yeah, right. Right. Okay. Right. No. The little tiny, one. Tiny, tiny. This one? No. no. Right. In the valley. In the valley out there. I'm going to have to get yeah. up to right the right. Yeah. Oh, you're talking way out here. And that white spot. I'm sorry, this oh, white spot. I'm that's sorry. Spot. Okay. So they built the chapel the where that spot path. to sanctify the ground. Oh, okay. And a lot of these structures weren't there in 89. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of cool to see. But that's when that's Moses, true. Mount Moses is up on the left side here. Which is, this is the chapel. That's the chapel the on the top. <clears throat> and so when he came. Oh. Okay. Think, no, okay. So when he came down, he would have seen and heard very well all the noise, all the lights. So the burning bush is still there. They actually had to move it at one point. Across the hall. And it, and across the yeah. Subway. And it reconnected to its old roots. Never lost a rose season. I have them. And so. Point out the leaf. Remember, the, uh, there was a monk or somebody that on Lenten Trace retreat. Trace Montarios mm -hmm. there. He brought some of those uh, in preserved. He, he oh. gave me that one when I was there in 89. Wow. So Mine's all brown, but... Justin, talk about the leaf. You know more. You talk about, talk about the leaf. Uh, it's the only plant on the earth that has flat, right angle stems mm -hmm. forming that cross. It's there, there are other there are other plants within the same species that grow endemic to the area, but they don't grow with the flat leaves. And uh, um, it's got its thorns. It's a red leaf, mm -hmm. red flower. Stems, and um, and um, the wall is to keep people from picking it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if uh, a six foot person reaching up is pretty much the bottom of the growth there. And uh, the. It was on the right side of that aisle, which is the back of the basilica. Mm -hmm. And it was, and you'll see, did you include the pictures of the chapel? Mm -hmm. So the, the chapel of the bush is behind the church. And it was, as the monastery got bigger, the sun couldn't get to it. So two of the monks had a dream one night to replant it across the aisle by means of cutting the trunk and sticking it back in the ground. <laughs> and within a day or two, it had reconnected to the old roots. <laughs> <laughs> and it never lost, nothing turned, nothing right. died. That's nothing, never had any problem. Um, so anyway, I wanted to show all of that to show just that, it, that it's still there to this day. But I wanted to, to end um, briefly looking at the, the burning bush. And specifically, right, Moses is told in that moment to remove his sandals. And he sees um, the angel of the Lord in the bush. And as we look forward to Lent coming up very soon, we're told to remove our sandals. Right? In Moses' first vision, the angel of the Lord speaks from within the fire. According to a saint of from the Syrian, the fire surrounding the Lord serves as a veil. Right? because he wasn't yet prepared to see God face to face as he would later in Sinai. Right? St. Jacob of Sarah, a wonderful Syriac saint, warns those who would push beyond the fire not to force the ascent, but rather to be spiritually prepared for the vision. St. Gregory of Nyssa points to Moses removing his sandals as the need for asceticism before approaching God. 
and to deny ourselves and be prepared before we can approach beyond the veil of the fire. Likewise, the Israelites are instructed to prepare themselves before Moses ascends the mountain by washing themselves, abstaining from sexual relations, and devoting themselves to prayer. And so we see through Moses in the burning bush and Sinai that only those who have prepared themselves through ascetical labor are able to see God. This theme gets picked up in many of the hymns as we prepare ourselves for Lent and during the first week or so of Lent. This wonderful hymn from from Matins on Forgiveness Sunday. Adam was evicted from paradise as one disobedient after partaking of its luxury. Moses saw God after cleansing the eyes of his soul by fasting. Hence, if we desire to become residents of paradise, let us divorce ourselves from baleful delights and desiring to see God as did Moses, let us fast to the four times ten. By sincerely persevering in prayer and supplication, let us suppress the passions of our souls. Let us avert the swellings of the flesh. Thus lightened, let us set off on the journey to things above, where the choirs of angels in unbroken song sing praise to the undivided trinity, to see the irresistible beauty of the Master. O Son of God and giver of life, we who set our hope on you entreat. Make us worthy of dancing with the armies of angels of Christ at the intercession of your mother, the apostles, martyrs, and all the saints. Amen. Okay. With that, we'll use that as our closing prayer. Okay, let's get it. Um, the suggested reading for next time as we move to talk about David, um, we'll read 1 Samuel, 1 Kingdoms, chapter 9, 16 through 17. 2 Samuel or 2 Kingdoms chapter 7, 1 Kings or 3 Kingdoms chapters 10 through 11, and 2 Kings or 4 Kingdoms chapters 17, 24 through 25. Um, and the only other thing I'll mention before I turn off the video, during Lent, what we'll be doing, as I, I mentioned to a few people before we started, uh, we have pre-sanctified liturgies, of course, on Wednesdays at, um, starting at 6.15. Dimitri and I are going to trade off during Lent, so that one night we'll have liturgical Greek, and the next night we'll have, or the next week we'll have Bible study. Um, right after liturgy, bring some snacks because for those of us who are fasting and taking communion, we're going to need to bump our blood sugar up a little bit. Um, so bring some fast-worthy snacks, you know, chips, pretzels, uh, fruit, veggies, whatever, uh, you know, Cliff bars, whatever we need. We can kind of share. We eat a little bit of uh, food, drink some water, and, and then go. Ahead and do Bible study. We'll keep the classes a little shorter in Lent than we might otherwise do, um, just because we'll be starting a little bit later. Um, Wouldn't they be around to start the Tom Hague still? I think so, yeah. 8 to 15. somewhere in that area. Good evening, everyone. Thank right. you, Father Deacon. Of course. Father. Before, should I just ask any other questions about what we, we ended with? All right. Yeah. Hey, one of the questions um, at Mount Sinai. There's the chapel on the golden... Of the golden calf. Calf. Mm -hmm. And which one is that? What's the... Well, so, you know, as we know, what happens is that as, as Moses goes up on Mount Sinai, he's there for quite a while. Right. And the Israelites get, get tired and think that Moses has abandoned them. And right. so they're going to make a way to worship God for themselves. And they melt down all the gold that they stole from Egypt. Not stole. Take with them from Egypt. The people actually give it to them saying basically get out of here, take our gold and go. Um, they melt it all down and create an idol that, that they can worship God with. Right, um, and, and that exists, is that what's in the No, so the golden calf doesn't exist because as we recall, what happens is Moses ends up coming down, he grinds it into a powder and makes everybody drink it. Oh. Everybody who worshiped it, he makes them drink it. Oh. Um, it's sort of reminiscent of some of the covenant curses that come later, like the, the water of testing and so on. Um, and then, and then, like we said, um, you know, they, they go and they kill, actually, the 3,000 men who worship the golden calf. Um, but what's happened is that in Sinai, they've built a chapel now in that spot so that God can be worshiped there and sanctify that spot in an appropriate manner. Um, yeah, basically rec reclaiming that, which, I mean, anybody who's been to Athens, for example, knows that they were very good at taking what were formerly demonic places and turning them into churches. 
to re-sanctify those places, okay. Parthenon and some of these places. Um, does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Does that yes, make sense? Okay. yes, I was a little bit, I, I knew about the golden right. cup, but I didn't know there was a chapel for it. Right, so not right, for it. yeah. It's really more a chapel for in place of it. Right, right. Yeah, right. I mean, I don't know who the, the chapel's dedicated to, whether it's, I don't know, you know Moses or Elijah, somebody. Um, but it's not a chapel to the golden calf. It's a mm -hmm. chapel in place of the golden calf, right? In okay. that spot. Thank you. Um, you know, casting it out in a sense. Um, Thank you. Of course. Yeah. Any other Thank questions? Yeah. yeah. When I go to Plainville, Ohio, I go to this OCA church, and there's beautiful iconography. Mm -hmm. And around the bottom of it is this flowy white curtains mm -hmm. with like it looks like sky mm -hmm. and I thought oh maybe it symbolizes that we're like in heaven now and Zoe mentioned to me no that's tenting oh it's interesting tenting around uh -huh. and you guys just talking about essentially what, like the tabernacle uh -huh. and so do they have you ever seen that in churches I think I know what you mean like in the bottom panel under the iconostasis no all no. around the church the whole church but oh but church. just but just kind of painted onto the bottom of yes. panel or whatever yeah yeah I've, I've seen that in a few places and um, Do you know why they do that? I've just always assumed it was more decorative in terms of essentially you don't want to put icons down where you can kick them um, and so you know it's a way to sort of decorate the space and not have it be blank wall space but decorated um, but it would make sense actually then for that imagery that they're using for that to be something like imagery from the tabernacle, right? From the tent of meeting. Can I ask Father John? Um, yeah, he might know. I mean, that, that would make a lot of sense. Um, my desk still has that. I was just gonna say, my desk still has that. In the bottom of the curtain, mm -hmm. is that where the, uh, shoot, the uh, pomegranates and and then the curtain and, the and, on the, and on the um, the, robes, right? the, the, uh, the high priest robes. Right. Incidentally, by the way, notice in Sirach, when you start getting into the Greek, it's talking about tassels mm -hmm. instead of pomegranates mm -hmm. from that passage okay. I read. So that's probably what pomegranates meant. Symbolism. Yeah. 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 That would be my yeah. guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. By the time you get to, I mean, Sirach is kind of second temple literature. By then they're talking about it being a tassel. Um, which incidentally, you know, if you look at like our bishop's vestments, they have tassels on the bottom and bells. Mm -hmm. You know how the oh, pomegranate yeah. has that fringy mm -hmm. end where the blossom was too? Mm -hmm. That's, that's shaped like a tassel. Probably that's like a tassel, yeah. yeah. Huh. Great, yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, any other questions? We'll let Dimitri yeah. get going. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. Thank you.